Chapter 45 Hone in his life and teaching Honan's Disciples, Part 3 1. Saikwambo Jinchi Saikambo Jinchi was a son of Norimori, the governor of the province of Echu, and a grandson of Shigamori Kamatsu, one of the highest officials of the Supreme Council of State. After the defeat of the Terra clan by the Minamoto, his mother, fearing something might befall him, went into hiding with him until the sixth year of Kenkyu, 1195, when in his thirteenth year she brought him to Honan. Whereupon Honan passed him over to Jikin, under whose guidance he became a priest. Shortly after this he returned to Honan and continued in his service with great faithfulness for eighteen years. Honan regarded him with special affection, instructing him in the Jodo doctrines, and even making him his own successor, as the transmitter of the perfect precepts. Thus it came about that Honan passed over to him nearly everything he had in the way of utensil, the images of the honorable ones whom he had worshipped, some of the temple buildings he had owned, and the copies of the sacred scriptures which he himself had conned. As Honan was drawing near to the end, Saikwambo said to him, I have for many years been indebted to you for instruction and counsel in the way of faith in the Nambutsu. But now will you not write me something with your own hand? that you think will be good for me, that I may preserve it as a memento. At this he took up his pen and wrote as follows. 2. Honan's Parting Message The One Sheet Document The method of final salvation that I have propounded is neither a sort of meditation, such as has been practiced by many scholars in China and Japan, nor is it a repetition of the Buddha's name by those who have studied and understood the deep meaning of it. It is nothing but the mere repetition of the Namo Amida Butsu, without a doubt of his mercy, whereby one may be born into the land of perfect bliss. The mere repetition with firm faith includes all the practical details, such as the threefold preparation of mind and the four practical rules. If I as an individual have any doctrine more profound than this, I should miss the mercy of the two honorable ones, Amida and Shaka, and be left out of the vow of the Amida Buddha. Those who believe this, though they clearly understand all the teachings Shaka taught throughout his whole life, should behave themselves like simple-minded folk who know not a single letter, or like ignorant nuns or monks those faith is implicitly simple. Thus without pedantic airs, they should fervently practice the repetition of the name of Amida, and that alone. The following is without question Honan's autograph, and a truly worthy model for all men in these later degenerate times, and it is still in circulation, known as the Ikamai Kishiman, one sheet document. 3. Why Saikwambo settled near the Kamo Shrine. After Honan's death, Jinchi lived in a place called Sasakino in the neighborhood of the Kamo Shrine. There is a story told which throws some light upon the reason for his choosing this location for his home. One day during Honan's last sickness, a lady of high rank came in a carriage to call on him. On alighting, she went in and had an interview. Now none of his disciples who had been waiting on him was in the room at the time, some having just chanced to step outside, and the others were resting. But Saikambo was sitting outside the door listening to what was going on inside, and he overheard the following conversation, I am deeply grieved that your end is so near, in spite of all our efforts to keep you with us. After you are gone, to whom shall we go for instruction about the Nembutsu? His reply was, I have written everything in the Senchikushu, and so he will be the transmitter of my doctrine who does not deviate from the record there. After a few more words, she took her leave, and there seemed something uncommonly noble in her appearance and demeanor. After a while his disciples came back, and Saikwambo was very curious to know in which direction the carriage had gone so he ran after it and overtook her, as she was riding along by the river bank towards the the north. All of a sudden, to his utter amazement, she vanished out of his sight. When he came back, he asked Honan who that lady of rank was that had just been visiting him. That, said Honan, is Queen Vadehi, and she lives near the Kumo Shrine some indeed may think such a thing beyond credence in these days but in recent times there have been many instances of such miraculous occurrences in the lives of Gadatsu, Mayo and other famous priests. Now as Honan was not only more venerable, but a man of still riper attainments, who had already reached the state of Samadhi, it is not at all to be wondered at, 
that he should reveal such supernatural powers. As Sai Quambo had seen this remarkable phenomenon with his own eyes, he took up his residence after Honan's death, in the vicinity of this shrine, and often used to go there to worship. 4. Sai Quambo's Character and Ojo Taking his career as a whole, he was very fond of the retired life, but the religious exercises he practiced were primarily for his own individual benefit. If when he was preaching, more than five or six people came to hear him, he used to stop short, saying, this will never do. The evil ones will now be upon us. On the twelfth day of the twelfth month in the first year of Raya Kunin, 1238, in his fifty-sixth year, with his head to the north, and facing the west, in the act of repeating the sacred name over two hundred times, he at last passed away, the final repetitions growing so inaudible that one could hear only the last two syllables of the prayers, Debutsu. He died in a room off the corridor adjoining the Kyutakin, which was a shrine temple dedicated to the god Kamo. At the time the sweetest perfume issued from before the Buddha's image filled his chamber, and actually continued for several days afterwards. Five. Zenshobo of the Renjeji Temple. Zenshobo, the abbot of the Renjeji Temple in the province of Tatami, was a Tendai scholar, but deeply conscious of his limitations, he felt sure that deliverance from the fated coil was quite beyond him, if he confined himself to the religious practices of his own section. Hearing that the lay monk Kumagai was an expert in the doctrines of the Nembutsu Ojo, he went to see him. After Kumagai had given him some explanations, he handed him a letter of introduction saying, you had better call on my teacher Honan, if you would like to hear more about it. Accordingly, Zenshobo went up to the capital to visit Honan at his residence in Yashimizu, and asked him how an ignorant sinner could attain birth into the pure land of perfect bliss. Honan went on to say, it is the Buddha Amida who is the lord of that land, and he has come to earth to effect an easy deliverance, and welcome to his own pure land all. Ignorant and Sinful Sentient Beings in the Ten Quarters even though they have been cast off by all the other Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, and had the gates into all their pure lands shut in their faces. This is indeed a most wonderful thing, and you should apply your mind to it with all possible diligence. The number of Buddhist canonical books, which have come to our county from China reaches over 5,000 volumes. But of these the two volumes Sutra on the Buddha and the Land of Endless Life. Life that containing the methods of meditation thereon, and the smaller Amata Sutra, are called the three sacred books of the Jodo sect, because they explain the way by which to attain birth into the land of perfect bliss. Now very very long ago there was a priest called Hozo, who made forty-eight vows, and established a pure land of perfect bliss. The eighteenth of these vows was to the effect, that he would come down and welcome into his land, and give Buddhahood, to all sentient beings without distinction, who truly yearned for birth into his land, and would call upon the name which he would obtain, when he himself reached Buddhahood. Thus Honan imparted to him in much detail an exposition of the validity of this original vow, and the certainty of attaining Ojo by the practice of the Nembutsu, so that Zenshobo became the most famous among Honan's disciples for the stability of his faith. Six, Honan's replies to Zenshobo's questions. Now this priest Zenshobo asked Honan several questions on difficult points in the Jodo doctrine, to which Honan made detailed replies, as follows. 1. How should we regard the so-called self-power and other power? He said, I, Genku, am just a common man, hailing from an out-of-the-way place not worth mentioning. I indeed have no qualifications to fit me for a visit to the imperial palace, but as I was invited there twice by his majesty, I went. Now this was wholly due to his own imperial will. In the very same way, common mortals, even the very worst, and most hopeless cases, who are utterly unqualified for that blissful land of real compensation, may, through the power of the Amida Buddha, as guaranteed us in his original vow, unquestionably receive his welcome to that land, by merely calling upon his sacred name. Though I be a great sinner and great fool, I must not doubt the way of Ojo, because anyone who does so has yet failed to understand the Buddha's vow, seeing that it was made for no other purpose than the saving of such sinners. So then, as you call upon his sacred name, do not entertain the faintest. 
doubt of its efficacy. In the words of his vow, all sentient beings of the ten quarters are included, all sorts of people, learned and ignorant, sinful and sinless, good and bad, lawkeepers and lawbreakers, men and women alike, even though they should belong to the hundred years period following the time when the three sacred treasures have perished from the earth. At that time people will not even know the names of the three kinds of discipline, for no sentient beings will then live longer than ten years. If forsooth, such creatures as these will receive his welcome by merely repeating the Nembutsu, how can we imagine ourselves to be rejected? The only possible obstacle to the attainment of Ojo is the lack of desire for the blissful land and neglecting to call upon the sacred name. The man who dilly-dallies over the Nembutsu repetitions must lose this boundless treasure, whereas the man who applies himself thereto is the one to whom a limitless enlightenment opens. So apply all your energies to the continuous practice of the Nembutsu. We say that sinner who is powerless in himself to do anything can find his way to that blissful land, by dependence upon that. Original vow and the Nembutsu repetitions. Now this is the same as dependence upon the vow of other power, or what is sometimes called the world transcending vow. 2. Ojo is for all alike. Those who fail to understand the meaning of this truth will doubt their own powers and not attain Ojo. Those who think that it is only the Nembutsu of the pious and learned which can eventuate in Ojo, and that there is no ojo for the ignorant and unlettered, and those who go on sinning every day, even if they should say the nembutsu, have not yet grasped the fact that the original vow includes both the good and the bad. It is impossible in this life to change man's nature, which he has inherited through the working of his karma from a pre-existent state, thus in the same way as it is impossible for a woman in this life to be changed into a man, no matter how much she might desire it. Those who call upon the sacred name should do it with the nature they now have, the wise man is a wise man, the fool is a fool, the pious is pious, the irreligious is irreligious, and thus all equally may. Attain Ojo. Whether a man is rich and noble, or poor and mean, whether he is kind or unkind, avaricious or morose, indeed no matter what he is, if he only repeats the Nembutsu, in dependence upon the mysterious power of the original vow, his Ojo is certain. Amida's original vow is made to take in all conceivable cases of people, whom he thus engaged to save, if they would but practice the Nembutsu. Without inquiring at all into the grade of their several capacities, but merely saying the Nembutsu in their simple earnestness, this is all that is needed for anybody. Bear in mind that everyone who thinks the Nembutsu Ojo is too lofty or too profound to be grasped has wholly misapprehended the very nature of the original vow itself. Can it be that unless I, Ginku attain the highest rank as Beto or Kenjio, I cannot attain Ojo, or that it would be quite beyond me if I merely remain what I was at my birth? Far from it. The fact is that all I have learned in my studies through the years is absolutely without avail in procuring the Ojo, and the one thing learning has taught me is its utter powerlessness to bring the ojo, 